All right, well, I'd like to uh, thank the course chairman for inviting me and, and, um, and Klaus for that setup on uh, osteoporotic fractures. Uh, uh, for, for probably all of us in this audience, certainly those of us who've been practicing for a while, these are just a bigger and bigger problem for us. And I don't see that trend changing anytime soon, but this is an area where uh, we don't have a consensus around the world, uh, certainly not even between North America and, and uh, Western Europe in terms of how uh, to optimally treat these patients. Uh, so, um, so let's just frame uh, what, what, what's the flavor of the problem here. Uh, this is a, a patient uh, with a T12, um, what we typically call senile burst fractures to uh, distinguish them from the, uh, from the younger patient with trauma burst fractures. Um, but uh, initially looks uh, not so bad. Uh, probably uh, Klaus would would call this uh, OF2, and, um, uh, uh, and and unfortunately, three months later, now has progressed to substantially greater kyphosis with worse pain. How do we uh, predict which of the patients is going to do this? Is still uh, difficult for us. Here's another aspect of the problem. Here's a, a patient with a T4 fracture. That was um, uh, insufficiency fracture uh, treated with just progressive ambulation, uh, but the problem was that uh, she developed uh, progressive lower extremity myelopathy, and as you can see uh, on the right side here, had to go on to uh, decompressive and stabilization surgery. Could we have predicted that this was gonna be uh, the outcome for her? And then uh, here's a patient that I saw uh, uh, some years ago when she was 75 years old, she had a motor vehicle accident 30 years ago, uh, was treated non-operatively for this, this uh, injury, uh, and, and although I don't have her initial injury films, presents to me now with progressive bilateral lower extremity weakness, and, and I see this and think, gosh, uh, this might have been a lot easier to treat when, when it was uh, first a fracture uh, and, and mobile. So, Part of the reason that we have uh, trouble uh, coming to consensus about the optimal treatment algorithms is because uh, the, the evidence that base that we have is, is far from complete right now. And I'll share with you some of the evidence that I think we have. Um, uh, you know, uh, so the, the effect of uh, uh, fragility fractures on sagittal alignment, clearly in the last 20 years, we've had a lot more understanding of the importance of sagittal alignment to patients' uh, general overall health, um, well-being, and, um, uh, and their function. In uh, last year in Italy, uh, there was a, a paper uh, that, that was presented and published with 110 patients um, with uh, vertebral compression fractures of at least 10 degrees of kyphosis. Uh, and, and what they showed was that um, those patients who had uh, at least 10 degrees kyphosis had worse disability and worse sagittal alignment. But interestingly, I, I'd like you to uh, focus on the, the uh, standing films on the right here. Uh, they made the distinction between uh, the hidden malalignment in which they have enough lumbar lordosis to compensate for that versus uh, the uncompensated um, malalignment in which they, they, they can't get enough lordosis in the lumbosacral area uh, to compensate for that. And I think um, that, that probably is a little inkling about how we should be looking at these patients. Uh, we know that, uh, that the Japanese are dealing with a, essentially a tidal wave of, of um, uh, fragility fractures, and, and so there's, there's a fair bit of good data that's coming out of there. Uh, this is a paper from uh, 2018 uh, with a series of 46 patients with vertebral compression fractures, um, and, uh, and 12 progressed to complete vertebral co collapse, uh, osteoporotic vertebral collapse. Um, and, and they looked at a number of parameters to try to say, uh, what, what, was, what was this predictable? The only thing that they found was this DSVA number, which basically was the, the, the distance from the center of that fractured vertebra to the SVA. So if you drop the C7 plumb line and, and uh, larger distances were associated with complete collapse if you treated these uh, non-operatively. Um, they looked at the pelvic parameters, PI, um, 
uh, the actual SVA number um, uh, or the actual kyphosis angle of the, the fractures, none of those correlated with risk of collapse. Another uh, uh, paper from uh, Japan, another series of 48 patients, uh, they, they wanted to know, um, what about non-union? 12 of their, so you know, a quarter of their patients went on to non-union. They also showed that this measurement, the DSVA of greater than five centimeters, uh, or PI uh, minus lumbar uh, lordosis of greater than 30 degrees, were associated with non-union. So the patients who were uh, uh, pitched further forward. Um, a, a paper with uh, multiple authors from uh, Germany and the Netherlands uh, had a, a paper that, that tried to look at the effect of treating these with an orthosis on their gait patterns um, and, um, and the sagittal angle. What they found was that, um, uh, you know, initially here was their global sagittal angle. Uh, treatment with the, uh, at six weeks with the brace improved that, but at, at six months they, uh, they had lost that improvement. And that's a theme, if you go through the literature, multiple treatments, whether they're non-operative or operative, will describe uh, loss of some of their sagittal correction over time. In Italy, uh, 24 patients were treated with a brace um, versus um, 15 with uh, percutaneous fixation, and they concluded that percutaneous uh, fixation was superior. The issue here, though, um, uh, if you go beyond just the abstract of the paper that I have, is um, uh, uh, what, what they what they uh, got was uh, 11 degree uh, uh, kyphosis um, uh, versus four degrees of kyphosis, and, and so um, so the question that I have is, uh, while they showed a statistical difference, uh, was that clinically significant? And I think that's still probably an open question. In uh, uh, North Korea, uh, we saw uh, uh, a, a series uh, in which they looked at <clears throat> um, what should be the goal when you're try trying to uh, correct uh, sagittal alignment for these osteoporotic thoracolumbar fractures. And, uh, and what they uh, defined as an unfavorable outcome was residual thoracolumbar kyphosis of greater than 20 degrees or fixation failure. Um, and they said, well, the, the risk factor here is, um, uh, is that if your, uh, your post-op uh, thoracolumbar kyphosis is greater than 10 degrees, that's a risk factor for pro progressing on to greater than 20 degrees at final follow-up. Uh, so they, they basically said uh, in their series, we lost about 10 degrees of kyphotic correction over a year. Um, and uh, they, they, again, uh, you ha I think, if, if you want to understand what's the evidence base that we can use to try to treat these patients, you're going to have to look past the abstracts because uh, they claimed a correlation between kyphosis and disability, but they didn't look at this and didn't present any uh, data on this. Uh, here's a paper um, that looked at a specific device called the Enforce for uh, kyphosis reduction um, out of Germany. Um, they had uh, something like 15 degrees of uh, local kyphosis uh, initially, they got it down to something like five degrees and then over time lost some of that correction. And, you know, uh, again, uh, I think each of us is gonna have to apply our own judgment here about whether that's clinically relevant, right? So if you took it from 15 degrees to an endpoint of 10 degrees, uh, I'm not sure how clinically relevant that is. Um, well, how about, uh, getting more aggressive. How about 360-degree uh, fusions for compression fractures? Um, uh, Spiegel, in their uh, uh, paper, uh, recommended 360-degree uh, fusions for their vertebral compression fractures uh, that are that are under 70 years old, and then hybrid stabilization, which they defined as um, uh, as uh, vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty at the fracture level, and then uh, augmented posterior fixation. Uh, 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 posteriorly around that. Um, I, I can just tell you in my practice, we're, we're, we're not that aggressive uh, as a rule. Um, uh, <clears throat> what about uh, patients who have Cummels disease? So, so um, 
uh, osteonecrosis of a vertebral compression fracture. Um, this is a paper out of, out of China from last year, a series of uh, 30 patients treated with uh, 360 fusions uh, with three-year follow-up. And, um, and they described, and they have uh, great uh, diagrams about how they did these uh, uh, surgeries, whether they um, uh, did um, vertebral uh, body resections or, or uh, uh, osteotomies. Um, and, uh, and so uh, great pictures. Uh, but out of 30 patients, uh, uh, three uh, persistent CFS, CSF leaks, four infections, one implant subsidence, two sort of pseudoarthroses, and I don't, I don't bl basically blame them for a, a PJK. So, so, um, so what I, I think we probably ought to keep in mind is that um, now with, um, with you know, fenestrated screw constructs, cement augmentation, that gives us a tool to use for fixation, on these patients, um, uh, automatic uh, uh, large surgeries for these patients does not come without risks to the patients. So, out of 30 patients, uh, you have uh, you know basically a, a dozen complications, surgical complications. Um, and in this series, although they they show that that these surgeries could be done, they took their SVA from six and a quarter centimeters to three centimeters. Again, um, in my elderly osteoporotic patients, uh, I question about how clinically significant that is. Uh, another paper out of China, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, that was just showing their, their post-op uh, uh, films. Um, another paper out of China uh, that I think is an interesting uh, concept here, um, asked the question, um, are we missing part of the picture here by only focusing on the bony elements. Should we be looking at the supporting musculature? And, um, and, and so what they looked at was uh, the, the rate of refracture after they augmented a compression fracture. So they, they cement augmented a compression fracture, and then, the, then they, they uh, patient sustained refracture. And what they showed was that uh, they had MRIs uh, of these patients and, and fatty infil infiltration uh, of the psoas and of the paraspinals was clearly uh, correlated with the risk of refracture. So yes, you can uh, put cement uh, into a, a vertebral compression fracture, give it some, uh, some uh, uh, stability to that bone, but if the patient doesn't have the stabilizing musculature, that may be in, in and of itself a risk factor for uh, later failure. And then, um, you know, other reasons that, that uh, we would use to operate, clearly uh, there's a case to be made in the ankylosed spine um, or patients with uh, epidural hematomas from their fracture with, uh, you know, neurologic uh, decrement. But uh, it, in the end, all, although all of these now are options because we have, um, uh, I think, a, a, a very powerful option with uh, cement augmented screws, um, I just want to share with you a recent patient I took care of. This is a 65-year-old who fell, um, had this uh, compression fracture, uh, 22 degrees of kyphosis and pain. Um, we put him in a brace, and I just saw him last week with, at two months um, and, uh, and no pain. We took his brace off, and he's uh, going back to deer hunting. So um, uh, I, I, while, while I, I think it's important for us to uh, continue to build on the evidence base to understand how to optimally treat these patients. And we have finally have some surgical options to add uh, structural stability around these fractures. Um, uh, I'm not convinced that the evidence uh, pushes us to operate on all of them. So in summary, um, you know, the, some of these osteoporotic thoracolumbar fractures will go on to non-union or progressive deformity um, and cause late pain. Um, and, and it seems that, that we're developing some evidence that says early surgery can prevent some of this, but at what risk to the patient? And, and right now, still very difficult to predict which ones uh, would benefit from this, uh, which are the ones that are at greatest risk uh, or would, would um, enjoy the greatest benefit of having uh, prophylactic surgery. <coughs> There is a general consensus that uh, severe osteoporotic 
compression fractures can warrant surgery. But right now, no clear consensus on the radiographic parameters that would constitute that. that that's at least my read on, on the, where, where we are in terms of the evidence base. Thanks for your attention. That was great, Dr. Choma. Thank you so much. Some super important information.